Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast. As always, I'm Callum and thankfully with me as always is Scott. Hello, how are we doing? Um, yeah, very well, <laughs> very well. Um, normally this is where we would say where we're uh, recording from, but uh, if, if you haven't noticed uh, a difference already um, in our audio, then... Um, well, specifically my audio. Or specifically this, this yours, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't want to say. <laughs> but um, we're actually, for the first time recording together so we are the same room we are but four feet apart (laughs) this time (laughs) exactly um but as as well as that we're also being treated to a uh, lovely fresh purpose-built studio um as our patreon can see yes you can you can see that (laughs) um (laughs) and uh on top of all of that there's even more um because we have our first Official sponsor. Sponsor. <laughs> I know, right? Which is yeah, which is awesome. Yeah. Um what seventeen seventeen uh, episodes, episodes in. in and we've we've got our first uh, yeah, man. sponsor, which is um yeah, which is also awesome. very incredible. Very exciting. Um and and on that note, um let's tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, go for it. Um this podcast is recorded and sponsored by Hellfire Studio, the first podcast, film and photography studio situated here in Essex. Just a mere forty-five minutes away from uh, from London, uh, Hellfire Studio also offers full creative content creation. So visit hellfirecreative.com for more info. Now, you lucky lot, as a, a listener of uh, Cryptid Ramblers podcast, you too can take advantage of our twenty percent discount code for podcast, video, and photography services here at Hellfire Studios uh, by using the code Cryptid at the checkout. There we go. <laughs> Which is uh, yeah, which is super cool. So yeah, thanks to the no. guys here for for that, for all of that. Really, the code, you know, the opportunity, and yeah, and just bring this here brilliant. because it's that, just yeah, an amazing. It seems like it's just come around, come along just at the right time because I'm sure as yeah. you guys listening, you would have noticed that we've been having some issues with the quality of our audio, and yes, we were yeah. we were trying to troubleshoot and spitball about how exactly we were going to try and make it better for you guys, and yeah, and then. We we got a note, we got a little message, a little DM. Yeah, it pretty much landed on our lap. Yeah, so, uh, talking about synchronicities, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it pretty much. Uh, that was certainly you know one of them, as, as you say. We yeah, we were talking about you know purchasing software and equipment and, yeah. and how we were going to do it, and almost putting a, a plan in place of, of how that was going to you know work. And then yeah, thankfully. Uh, Ben slid into my DMs. <laughs> he certainly <laughs> did, didn't he? And, uh, Dirty bugger. <laughs> Dirty bugger. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, as they say, one thing led to another. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and here we are in a darkened room. <laughs> <laughs> here we are in a, in a yeah, darkened room, soundproofed. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but no, thanks to thanks those guys for this opportunity. And, uh, yeah, it's um, it's going to be a, it's going to be a different one. It is, isn't it? it? Actually, Looking at you, yeah, yeah <laughs> I mean, in the same is, room. This is weird. Not it's just a lot of a screen. It's just a lot of firsts all at once, isn't yeah. it? We're well, we room. haven't actually seen each other in person, no, since before lockdown. So we're talking like yeah, March twenty twenty. Airsoft, airsoft, airsoft. Then, wasn't it? We, it was. we went, yeah. Oh yeah, no, yeah. It would have been. It would have been what the last, summer, not summer now. Last, last summer, year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Crikey. So maybe May. I think May, so. Yeah, May, I think May, June last year, probably. Yeah. So yeah, so we actually seen each other in person for the first time, Very recording odd. a new episode. We're in a new studio, new equipment. It's um, yeah, as you can probably tell from our voices, yeah. it's uh, Very excited quite exciting. This. So um, yeah, so thanks again to, to those guys, and uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoy and, and notice the uh, difference, which yeah, I have no doubt you uh, you will. Um, now on the subject of uh, announcements, um, we'd like to. Uh, Give a shout out to uh, our uh, patrons, uh, Justin and James. Yes. Um, welcome aboard, James. Thank you for the uh, for the support. Um, and yeah, th- and thank you both for the continued support. It's um, yeah, it's much uh, much appreciated. Not just the the patron, of course, but uh, I know you've both sent in sort of theories and, and questions and mm. whatever else that's kept us uh, sort of occupied in between episodes. And yeah. a lot of the content has actually made it onto. Episodes. It has, so, yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you both for contributing for listeners. That. Yeah, Absolutely, that's, that's what uh, that's what we want. That's yeah, that's what it's about. Um, and for anyone anyone else listening who, who may be interested, of course, we have our Patreon uh, page, which can be found uh, searching for Cryptid Ramblers podcast. So 
made it nice and easy for you. Nice and simple. <laughs> no excuses. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we also uh, still have our newly released uh, merch store at uh, creatorspring.com. Yep. And as the uh, patrons will see, we're uh, beautifully wonderful. modeling the uh, How t-shirts. wonderful merch. <laughs> uh-huh. I heart West Virginia is. Yeah. Uh, is we all do. Favorite. But we all do. We all is, do. Uh, as anyone listening will uh, will now attest to. Um, but aside from the, the t shirts that we are obviously beautifully modeling, um, we've got hoodies, mugs, and uh, even face masks, keeping it uh, current as, oh, we, as we like to do here yep. at uh, Cryptid Ramblers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, yes, I think that's, um, that's it for the, uh, the excitement and the, the, uh, yeah. the announcements. <laughs> it is indeed. Um, and now turning to, uh, to this week's, uh, episode. The subject um, at hand. Absolutely. We're, uh, yeah, we're going to take it a bit easy, um, this time. Um, so sadly we're not going to find ourselves in, uh, in Helia, Kentucky. No. With, um. Yeah, I wouldn't say we've closed the door on that one, but we've, no. we've certainly finished our current deep dive of uh, well, of the first two seasons. That's opened so. up a lot for us, though, hasn't it? Let's be honest. Especially it's been with, ridiculous. With, like your work on Twitter, you have been, been super busy since yeah. that episode dropped last week, <laughs> yeah. and like you've been, it's, it's been brilliant. I've received like little screenshots from Twitter, and and like, oh my god, excitable <laughs> voice notes. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> this person's contacting that person, and everything is absolutely brilliant. That the Helia team have, have listened to us as well. I think they, that's yeah, they absolutely have. incredible. Which, which we would have quite literally dreamt of. Yeah. I think when we started recording the, the part one of, uh, of Helia, you know, even if they just acknowledged, you know, that we existed and were, you know, covering, you mm. know, their hard work, which, you know, admittedly a lot of the guys, um, you know, did so, you know, uh, like Dana Newkirk, for example. So, yeah, you know, and, thanks and to her for some of the likes and, and Carl Pfeiffer, man, you gave us a real big shout out, and that is yeah, really, really, really appreciated. You yeah, because never... you didn't have to, and Absolutely. you know, it was just you know a genuine sort of show of kindness, really, that you mm. not only liked a particular tweet, but that you, you responded to it. Um, you know, you, you quoted it. I think is the the Twitter term, um, and just yeah, and just responded. Um, Thanking us for doing the, you know, the sort yeah. of deep dive and saying that you were enjoying it, and that I think that alone, I think, contributed That's to a large boost. Our part three episode just blowing up, yeah. um, and you know, quite literally blown up. You know, we, we saw numbers on our listens in the first couple of days, which we've not had on any other yeah. episode, and yeah, it's no coincidence that the two <laughs> kind of, yeah, certainly not, sort of, you know, um, went hand in hand. So. Um, yeah, so thanks, and, and not just to those guys, but to everyone who's uh, who's listened um, and uh, you know played that episode. Uh, I think in the first two or three days, it, it hit crazy numbers, crazy numbers for us anyway. You know, yeah, we'd like absolutely you know, we'd like to try and stay humble with it and <laughs> just try and stay down to earth. Yeah, it's uh, despite it's, our content, exactly despite know, the so. content. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's just it's just been crazy. So yeah, thank you to the, the Helia guys and to all you other listeners that have. Mm. Helped get that episode to, um, yeah, the crazy heights that it has. Yeah, um, yeah as I say, this this episode is, is going to be a slightly um, lighter lighter note, um, and we're going to be back sort of all over the place. Really, we're going to be yeah. in sort of UK, Europe, we're gonna be, um, we're, well, going global, baby, going global. Yeah, yeah. we're going to be yeah out of Kentucky and. I think well, for the most be, part out of the states, we might be popping back. to oh, we'll be there a for few a familiar bit. hotspots. With some of the stuff that I found, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll certainly be back in that way. Yeah, um, potentially very close vicinity to all of that. Yeah, so yeah, you know, we do love West Virginia after all. Well, exactly, so. and we, we can't. We <laughs> quite literally can't tear ourselves. Uh, no, we can't away from it. It just keeps keeps bringing us back. We keep getting drawn back, um, despite the fact that we might try and not go back, mm. but. Through the nature of what we research, we inevitably well, do we're going end as, up. We're going as far afield as Indonesia and yeah. uh, and the Philippines as well. So yeah. we are going all over and potentially even to mythical lands. Absolutely. I'll, I'll yeah. drop Hyperborea in there Ooh, for you. Oh, wow. Okay. Hyperborea. That's a, that's a tease. It is a tease. <laughs> Stop it, you. <laughs> <laughs> we're going ancient Greek on this. Oh, that's yeah. what we're doing. Lovely. Um, <laughs> so I suppose to, um, you know, speaking of teasing, I suppose we should uh, actually... Announce what we're going to be covering because yeah. uh, I know yeah. we were uh, at the end of 
Well, they would have seen the thumbnail by now. So, yeah. Well, yeah. They so, yeah. they um. But by now they would have done. Uh, but at the time of recording, there was uh, there's been no real no kind hints. of hints or anything. Um, because we were still deciding on on kind of what to do and whether to do another deep dive or whether to sort of take it easy mm-hmm. and have a bit of a more light hearted one. I think off the back of you know certainly part three alone being a good what well, three. Three and a quarter hours, yeah, three Something hours, like that. wasn't it? At we, we very thought, least, not only for us and you know dialing down on the research, but also you know for you guys, to, you know, give you guys a sort of a break. We'd yeah, we'd, we'd sort of yeah, diet down a little bit, and um, yeah, we're actually going to dive into the world of uh, elves. Um, yes, indeed, following on from our previous work on you know goblins and, and fairies, mm. as we discussed in those episodes, you know, elves are also of the same you know sort of ilk, so. Uh, yeah, it felt it felt right to sort yeah. of follow or continue following that path mm. um, after you know the detour through uh, through Hellier, um, and so uh, yeah, and so that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, now, I suppose as always, we you know we try to start with a bit of you know origins or a bit of mm. you know backstory because you know I'm sure you know when you mention Elf instantly, your mind probably goes to Either Tolkien, you know, which we will come on, yep. come on to, sorry, um, or, or Buddy, Buddy, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what I was going to say. Santa's, <laughs> Santa's little helpers, yeah, <laughs> um, which, yeah, interestingly, uh, sort of a fairly recent iteration, but yeah, you know, again, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll come on to that sort of uh, a little bit, but um, yeah, for those that uh, that that don't know or would like to know, um, an elf is a type of uh, humanoid supernatural being. Um, originating mostly in Germanic folklore, which again, I think follows the, the sort of the goblin uh, and sort of fairy uh, backstory from, from what we looked at. Um, in medieval Germanic cultures, um, elves were generally seen as beings with magical powers and supernatural beauty. Um, and they would supposedly act indifferent towards humans, um, either helping them or hindering them. There didn't seem to be much of a, mm. a sort of a happy medium. It was either one or the other. They were either helpful, yeah, or they were little which shits. Is, which is one <laughs> of the, the characteristics of Tolkien's elves, isn't it? You've yes. either, you've either got yeah. the really helpful ones, or you're just going. Oh, I'm indifferent to you. Yeah, See ones you I couldn't care less about it, sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, so he, he definitely tapped into, you know, tapped into that. And I think also, um, sort of getting ahead of ourselves a bit, but um, J.K. Rowling, in the same, in the same sense, had you know the. The sort of the house elves, yeah, Dobby, which was you know sort We've of protective and, and helpful yeah. and whatever. But then you also had the sort of the horrible mischievous ones, creature, and the, yeah. There's the other one where it was, yeah. it was just a bit of a bugger, just a bit of a shit, yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, interestingly, I found that um, in most Germanic languages, the word elf uh, is believed to have meant white being. Oh, now. There wasn't really any context for that in terms of where that came from or, or why why that sort of name was given. I can only imagine that it's based on their their sort of early appearance. Um, I guess so. Again, as we know from Tolkien, J.K. Rowling, you know, Christmas elves white and whatever, hair and, and everything. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. so many different iterations. It, it's obviously quite a an old term now, but um, yeah, that's certainly what I. Oh wow! Okay. What I sort of, yeah, what I found. Um, but yes, yeah, as, as we say, like many of the cryptids that we've covered um, already, they take on different traits depending on their place of origin. Um, and again, as I think as always, um, the main three um, seem to be Christian, um, English, old and new, and uh, and of course North, Norse mythology. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, elves can be linked with either causing illness. Um, having magic, um, having this otherworldly or supernatural uh, beauty, <laughs> and seduction, <Ooh. laughs> apparently, Ooh. which uh, again we'll come on to later. I found quite a funny, uh, quite an intriguing. Oh, we're getting a bit blue, aren't we? No, oh, yeah, yeah, we're getting a bit <laughs> X-rated. So, any kids listening? <laughs> yeah, cover, cover your ears. Duck out now. <laughs> yeah, now. We, we did say it was going to be a lighter episode. It might not be. <laughs> yeah, it'll be going. It'll be going dark, but uh, yeah. for a different reason. <laughs> Um, yeah, Fifty now, Shades of White Being. <laughs> yeah, Fifty Shades of Elf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, not, not long after the sort of medieval period, um, the word elf 
interestingly, was replaced eventually with other words that we've also covered and are probably more accustomed to, like uh, dwarf and fairy, mm. the two, obviously, ones that we've covered. Um, also, another meaning was hidden being. Hidden being. And I think that, and that relates to, again, their origin, similar to that of dwarves and, and goblins, you know, sort of woodland creatures. Mm. Um, yeah, we've kind of surmised that interdimensional. That, and that, yeah. yeah, and that as well, uh, which is, a, again, a theory that I know you and I have discussed as well in, in, uh, in previous episodes. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, I think the main reason for that is, is stories of, have kind of spilled over from, say, the, you know, Germanic folklore and, and Germanic language speaking um, sort of territories. Mm. Um, also, it, but spilled into like Scotland, um, you know, Scandinavia, um, and as well as England and, and, yeah. and parts of the well, UK. Yeah, as, as the so, people migrate, their tales come along as yeah. well, which is what we found. And so I think that's West why Virginia as well, isn't yeah, it? exactly. And I think that's why the various um, sort of names have been used because, again, as we discussed before, um, they're all kind of one of the same. Mm. So, you know, we could go over you know, sort of the goblin stuff and, you know, typically it would sound like a fairy or an elf and, and you know, and vice versa. Um, but the, yeah, the interesting thing, I think it mostly came out of Scandinavia and I think more, more prominently um, Iceland, um, is that some elves or certainly their iteration of elves would seduce and or abduct humans. Um, which, Again, that's something that we is, found with, Especially with the fey folk sort of thing, yeah. Not so much with the goblin, just no. Which I, which I, I thought was expecting odd. more of yeah. that with the goblin stuff than with the fey, really. Yeah, no, definitely no. I think you, yeah, I think a lot of the perceptions of goblins and elves, certainly from what I found in this research, are kind of switched. So what you'd mm. expect an elf to be in terms of like appearance and attitude and whatever is actually a goblin, and then what you'd expect a goblin to be. Is actually what an elf is yeah. in terms of its attitude and how it treats people and and uh, yeah, just general being a dick, <laughs> just being a bit of a dick. That's our, that's our one rule in our house, and that's one rule: don't, don't be, be a dick. dick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just hashtag don't be a dick. Hashtag don't be a dick. So twenty olds yeah. listening, <laughs> pack it in. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, and I think that's kind of fed into. As well, the general belief in elves, which has seemingly been divided somewhat over the years, that's that's kind of surpassed following the, that sort of medieval um, period, um, mm. to the point where it wasn't necessarily banished, um, but it was certainly kind of well, kind of frowned upon, I guess. So it, its popularity in in kind of pop culture, if you like, mm. at, at those times, eventually kind of you know died out. Um, and, and interestingly, it was it was essentially reintroduced by um, by good old Billy Shakespeare. Oh, Billy Shakespeare! Oh, Billy yeah. Shakespeare, yeah. yeah. Um, or William, as you, you know, it's Billy to his friends, but you know, you lot might know him as William Shakespeare. <laughs> William Shakespeare, <laughs> literary. <laughs> yeah. um, now, yeah, he, his kind of reintroduction um, played a part mainly with uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, and I know that came up in the. Goblins episode because uh, the character Puck mm. um, is probably the most famous, um, you know, from that. So yeah, it was kind of his reintroduction. Obviously, that you know that kind of blew up, and it was from that influence really that the Germanic uh, folklore and the Germanic language speaking uh, territories also reintroduced the elf um, themselves, and that in turn has then led to you know a lot of the um, iterations that we know now so again mm. mentioning things like jk rowling uh, jr tolkien christmas elves christmas elves stuff. that they all fed off of this kind of reintroduction by gotcha. technically by shakespeare but indirectly by the he's got a lot to answer folklore. for he's got a lot to answer for yeah <laughs> i mean that's to be honest it, like anyone that's into like conspiracies and stuff like that mm. william shakespeare's subject's a very good one that is a very good one it's even a very, from very the good one. little that i know on it it's uh Quite an eye opener. Yeah, <laughs> he might not have been who he said he was. He, yeah, he might not have been the brains behind the uh, operation, he as might, it were. Might yeah. have been a ghostwriter. Absolutely, yeah. Um, 
but we'll we'll save that one for another day, I yeah. think. Or if that's one that our our bros in NAC yeah. want to take on, there you go. You can have, have that on us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but yeah, um, yeah. As you rightly say, the you know the sort of the Christmas elves or the you know Santa's little helpers, they're actually a fairly um, they're actually a fairly recent introduction with with their first literary mention mm. coming in around 1856. Um, when you consider the legend of Santa and you know all that 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 kind of well, yeah, story. There's a, a it's been going for hundreds of years. Well, yeah, that that's a that's a, a an origin that goes back a, yeah, a, a long, long way, yeah, a really really and, long way, and not even probably even that's in the got part of the world. even that's got uh, Norse connections as well. You know, yeah, that in itself, the, it the whole image of it, the fact it's got eight reindeer, it's mm. basically Santa is Odin. Yeah, well, certainly, yeah, you know, one that, of the, that's basically that's one what of the it origins. Comes down to. Yeah, incredible. Well, so I, think, I think he's also got a um, uh, Indian or, or Asian um, sort of yeah, origin right, there is. as well. Um, that he obviously his name wasn't Santa Claus; it was a, a, a name more fitting of that region. Mm. But that's where they believe the story came from. It, it almost, from what I can remember, it, it almost read like a kind of um, Asian sort of Robin Hood type story, yeah. where he, you know, sort of a, a, you know a peasant, and he would steal from. You know the more wealthy and give to the poor kids and that kind of thing, and and that's yeah. and but he would drop the gifts on their doorstep in the middle of the night and then you know and not be seen doing it. And so I think mm. that's where the whole coming down the chimney thing came from. Yeah. Um, but again, I mean that's a that's a whole diff- that's a whole yeah, episode we'll, on its own. So yeah, we'll cover that cryptid later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's about halfway through the nineteenth century. So about eighteen fifty six was its first literary mention of um, of the the elves uh, specifically. Um, so yeah, when as I say, when you consider how far back Santa goes, it's really, elves it's go back really, it's, much further. They go back much further, but in terms of being linked to Santa, mm. that wasn't really that long ago that no. they were kind of thought up. And again, it was only in sort of a story, and so then someone's read that story, mm. and it's kind of blown up to this whole well, kind of legend. Well, I might have uh, a little something to say about that. With the connection that I find yes, later absolutely. on, yes, absolutely, yeah, actually, um, yeah, you're right, yeah. That because that again, that's that's something that I didn't find, mm. but actually, you know what, well, that might have a little connection. So I'll go on nice. about that hyperborea again <laughs> later, later on. on in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, then so, so that was that, and then sort of feeding off of that again, you've got the you know the famous um, iteration of uh, elves by J.I.R. Tolkien. Um, you know, of course, you know. Legolas to of name the sort of the, the famous one, um, but he actually popularised them as what we know Legolas and, and those elves to be, which is the more kind of human-sized, human-like uh, beings. Mm. You know, and sort of very you know nimble, light on their feet. Um, you know, very sort of for the most part, you know, kind of helpful. And the more yeah, the more helpful um, elf as opposed mm. to the other iteration, which is the the hindering, which again, some of the characters did take on, you Absolutely. know, them, themselves. So he did attack that kind of double-edged that duality. sword. Or, yeah, absolutely, duality. Yeah, um, but obviously, from what we'll go through for you know a lot of the stuff that you found, mm. um, you know, this sort of human-sized and, and human-like beings isn't necessarily their origin. So no. Tol- you can almost credit Tolkien for creating that kind of yeah oh, human-sized yeah. iteration of them. Um, the other one that again we mentioned um, not too long ago uh, was uh, Miss Rowling um, mm. and and her uh, sort of iteration. Which, interestingly, from what we now you know kind of know for our deep dives on the previous episodes, is that her iteration of elves or the house elves mm. are actually goblins. Yeah. Um, but again, again is that, that one of the same thing. Yeah. Again, one of the same things. So yeah. you can be forgiven for depicting an elf as a goblin and, and vice versa. And this, this was our yeah. this was our fear with regards to looking at these sort of subjects individually and, and, mm. and maybe regurgitating previous episodes. But yeah. luckily enough, they might be on the surface one of the same thing and mm. and all categorized together. But there are differences at the oh, very yeah. least. Notable differences, yeah. yeah. Certainly from yeah, 
parts of the world where they originate, you know, appearance, you know, demeanor, and all that kind of thing, in, which I know you'll come on to. Absolutely. I mean, in yeah. this one in particular, there's less less stories mm. about elves. Yeah. And I've found more anthropological and archaeological yeah. evidence to suggest that yeah. potentially may have actually been a real world yeah, origin. Exactly. Fact, which yeah. is the first time we've we've dealt with something like that. First this. time we've done that, yeah. I was gonna say normally we find sightings and encounters and, you know, on the more kind of mythical side. But um, you know, as you say from from the great research that you've done, you know, we've actually got a yeah, we've actually potentially got a real world origin and, and sort of integration yeah. into a fossil record sort of site and, and actual fossils and, and known <laughs> records mad. and stuff which is nuts yeah but uh but yeah we'll come on to uh we'll come on to that um but yeah as i say since middle ages and like many things when christianity took over um across most of europe belief in in elves sort of dwindled um as it was classed as a pagan belief um and nothing more than superstition mm. so with a lot of things that we've covered, the Christians sort of oh, came yeah. in, beat it out of people, and um, sort of said, "No, that's, if you believe in that, that's the devil." Or, that's uh, you know, monotheism for you. Yep, absolutely. So um, <laughs> yeah, so again, it's just uh, not trying to you know sort of give too much of a you know religious undertone, but again, like with many of the other things that we've looked into, um, mm. Christianity does seem to have quite a heavy hand in you know sort of controlling what is believed and what is made information. Control. I guess mainstream yeah just yeah. yeah information control um and i suppose and on that uh, on that note one of uh, i actually found an elf um uh reference um from uh, the good book oh really uh, yeah um well, one of the major ones that that i found is that is the belief that um elves were spawned in the aftermath of um cain's murder of his brother abel Oh. And that it was from that kind of uh, that unrest and that kind of ill feeling that these creatures were sort of spawned off Excellent. the back of that. Um, and obviously, you know, for anyone that doesn't know, because um, admittedly I didn't, um, Cain and Abel um, are the first two sons of Adam and Eve. Mm. Um, they did have. I did find out they they did actually have a third uh, son. Um, no, okay, fuck about it, I, can, I can tell you what his name was, <laughs> and I only and I only read it last night. <laughs> I think it was like John or something. I don't know, Dave. Yeah, I don't know. Everyone knows a Dave. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Ask me and my son Dave. <laughs> yeah. Never seen him before. <laughs> you never seen him before. Yeah, yeah. He's the, the weird brother in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but no, I thought that was quite interesting. Sort of off the back of that sort of suppression yeah. of the belief in in elves, and then there's this actual, you know, kind of backstory that there's this belief that yeah it was well there's also to to, to expand upon that on a slightly different subject there's the idea that um of the nephilim which come from the the old testament and nephilim okay. were the race of giants and they were said oh, to have right, built okay. giant stone monuments and built huge burial mounds for their own people and oh, right, okay. in north america yeah they found in the especially in the the, the 19th century especially they found huge skeletons yes like, they have yeah, we're talking yeah. like 9 10 11 feet tall yeah um and and uh, genuine skeletons as well like some complete parts there's a well. plethora mm. of news articles about these various different findings of these these giant skeletons and yeah. and also the 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 the, the they're much smaller counterparts the yeah. pygmy sort of yeah. burials as well which where, yeah. where I've gone with it um, so, yeah, we already know that the, the, the Great Flood is something mm. that happened around about twelve to thirteen thousand years ago. Yeah. We already know that happened. Yeah. So maybe What's with the Old that? Testament, yeah. at the very least, that maybe that's actually a retelling of history, and it's yeah. just been muddied through translations throughout the ages. Dramatized a little bit for it's a possibility. But again. Control. Or Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to or... communion or anything like that. But yeah, we're not going straight to church after <laughs> this. But uh... but it, there's it, so there's might be something to it. to it. Yeah, you know, no, absolutely. I think you've got to, you know, if you're going to look into, you know, sort of, you know, the, the weird and wonderful that we have, and you know, mm. and believe in a lot of these phenomena and a lot of these sort of cryptids, then you know, I think you'd be, um, you know, fool to not sort of absolutely. believe in aspects of other 
you know elements and obviously you know religion being one of the you know one of the biggest and mm. but yeah i just thought it was interesting that you know there was this kind of suppression again by christianity of of sort of certain beliefs that didn't kind of fit into their you know their own sort of regime or you know um their sort of task at hand yet there was a early reference in you know sort of the good book of these actually existing as far yeah. as they're concerned and, and this is where it sort of came from um so yeah i just thought that was quite quite interesting um now this kind of this may well kind of feed into what you're gonna um discuss in you know a little bit later um and i know we we mentioned it before um mm. but there are some um scholars from both the 19th and 20th century uh, who attempted to rationalize um, the belief in elves um, as kind of folk memories of in- indigenous peoples. So, mm. oh, okay. so I not just sort of, yes, yeah, so, and you know, they're not just sort of saying that, you know, it's, it's all just fairy tales and, and made up and, and whatever else. They try to kind of rationalize that, you know, there might yeah. be some kind of, yeah, real world links, um, which I know is, is kind of exactly the path Absolutely. that, you know, that you've, uh, you've gone down. Um, now, this was done mostly because of the pop- popular belief in the supernatural. Um, but it, 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 it turns out that as far as these scholars are concerned, that there is actually a lot of truth to a lot of these beliefs. So it isn't just, you know, nonsense mm. or, you know, fairy tales, stories or whatever, there is actually there might be some truth and evidence like to it. You know, and these are scholars, so you know, who are we to argue, right? <laughs> it's certainly <laughs> indeed. I um, believe the experts. Now getting a bit um I suppose a little bit dark and this might be where we put in a uh, little trigger warning. A trigger warning. Um but you know only relaying it because I I thought it was quite interesting and though we've touched on it before again in previous episodes. But it was also believed, and I don't know whether it's by the same scholars, um, that people would um, use the belief in elves um, as an excuse uh, for uh, children that were sadly born with uh, defects mm. or disabilities. Um, you know, you've got to think this is like hundreds of, of years ago, one, 200 years ago, maybe. So it was obviously far more of a, a kind of a taboo or a, a shameful thing on not only the parent but the child itself if yeah. it was born with a disability or a you know or a, a defect so it was easier for the parents presumably to say oh well you know my healthy baby was snatched and, mm. and swapped with this like elf or goblin or, or changeling as i yeah. know we've mentioned changeling was the, previous was the term episodes. they used wasn't it that was the term that was that was coined um you know sort of because of that and uh yeah as i say it was it was used as an excuse or it was a belief that healthy human children were being switched by elves with changelings um in a way of uh, in, in a way for sort of elves and, and goblins to uh strengthen their herd i guess yeah. for want of a, a better phrase um yeah because we've got this kind of complex as as human beings we've got this complex that we're special yeah, there, there's something about <laughs> us that, that everyone else wants. wants. Yeah, you know, like so you got all these alien abductions. They want something from us. They want our yeah. eggs and they want our their, yeah. our fertility and and, and yeah. such. We don't know this for sure. Don't know but for sure. We've got this sort of complex that we yeah, are a, a big deal. We're kind of. I, I don't know if you don't know this, but I'm kind of a big deal. We've all got uh, <laughs> furniture Burger made of syndrome. rich mahogany and <laughs> lots of leather bound books. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. No, and I think you're right. And I think that's kind of where this is kind of birthed from, really, inadvertently as wrong as we may now think it is. Yeah. You know, with that, the, you know, the, you know, the perspective and whatever that we've got now. Um, but it's believed that this also birthed the word, um, oath. Oath. You know, so, yeah, you know, sort of, you know, big oath. Oh, big oath. Big oath. Oh, okay. for, you know, that, that gotcha. kind of thing. They, they reckon that that word, is a sort of an iteration of, of elf because of that meaning. So if a child was born with a certain defect or disability, they were referred to as an oaf. Oh, right. Which which was like a negative view of an elf. Gotcha. And so they, and that's like where like they the think, elf reject sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. So, and, and that's where it's, um, yeah, it's believed that that, yeah, the oaf came from. Oh. Uh, in that. So it is a, 
a, de- a derogatory uh, sort of word in, gotcha. in, in, in the way that it's been created and, and used. Um, now, uh, just to end on a couple of bits before so you go into your yeah. research, yeah, into my... um, just for a bit of uh, local knowledge uh, for anyone in Ooh. the uh, in the UK, um, Elverdon Forest uh, in Suffolk, um, which to us is known for having a big centre parks. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, although other holiday camps are available. Um, <laughs> no paid promotion. No paid promotion. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, Elverdon actually means Elf's Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, which I didn't know. I suppose when you break it so, down, when you break it down, it makes Elvin, sense. Isn't it? Elf, <laughs> Elf Don. Yeah. Elf Den. Elf Hill. Yeah. yeah. So when you know and you sort of look at it, you think, oh yeah, that's obvious. But until I read it, I couldn't have. I never would no, have no, guessed. No, no, it's just a name. It's just a, it's just a series of sounds. You just know until it's, you yeah. Realize what three, the meaning is. Three syllables or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, a bit of um, bit of local uh, local knowledge. Um, and yeah, like I said, we've already sort of discussed that obviously elves are likened to more in the sort of UK and, and parts of Europe. Uh, things like kobold, um, dwarf, brownies, mm. fairies. Uh, Puck, um, which is a character from yep. Midsummer Night's Dream, which we already covered, Hobgoblins, and um, Robin Goodfellow, um, who's the little house fairy that we uh, ah, discussed in, uh, yeah, the good one uh, in, in our previous uh, previous episode. Um, and that, uh, that, I'd say, for the most part, is kind of the origin and sort of, mm. yeah, it covers the sort of various iterations of uh, elves, certainly from what I've found, the, you know, the more sort of compelling stuff. Um, Certainly in literature, that's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess we're now going to go into the more kind of real world. Yeah. Uh, real world sort of Which, in all potential honesty, origin. In all honesty, I didn't think I'd be going down this sort of route with it. I didn't and, think there would be one, in all honesty. Yeah. So when you started sort of telling me, because I didn't want to know too much, because I wanted to hear this for the first time oh, okay, as well yeah. as the listeners. So I know you sort of mentioned a few little... Bits and uh, drop a few bread crumbs. In there, yeah, exactly. Sure. So, well, yeah, looking forward to this. My research initially took me back over to uh, stateside and uh, with uh, the origins from the Native Americans, and in particular, um, the Arapaho, the Sioux, uh, the Cheyenne, and the Crow tribes all had yeah. stories and interactions with little people. Yep. Um, and they were around. 20 to 20 inches to three feet tall and some tribes actually called them the tiny people eaters wow which okay. is i don't know what you want to take from that um but they were supposed to be like uh like spirits which was interesting right okay the spirits yeah, yeah. they weren't just um physical they were ethereal they were mm. able to move in and out like a spirit they were yeah. healers they were magical yeah. similar to leprechauns and fairies from yeah. from europe yeah. now the shoshone indians of wyoming um, they actually had a name for for these tiny race of, of, of people, right? And they were known as the uh, Ni Miriga. Oh, okay, yeah. And the legends told of the little people attacking them with tiny bows and poisoned arrows, right? Okay. So they weren't particularly nice, no. Um, and now the uh, Miriga were also known to kill their own mm. by right. a blow to the back of the head if they became ill or too old, oh, right. right? But this was something as well that was a common practice with Native Americans as well, especially with the, the nomadic tribes, yeah. the ones that didn't necessarily settle mm. and they would travel about. And so it's the idea of the the lame wildebeest gets yeah. less, left behind. Left at the back, thing. sort of, to get picked yeah, off. Yeah. Survival of the fittest sort yeah. of thing. Um, now, this led my uh, research still within Wyoming in particular. And in 1932, in the Pedro Mountains, Oh, yeah. They these two men were digging for gold in the San Pedro Mountains, and which was around about sixty miles southwest of Casper, Wyoming. Okay. After continually working a rich vein and running only into more and more rock, uh, Cecil Main and Frank Carr used dynamite to blast a section of the mountainside to get gold, which was yep. a regular which practice. Is what they do, yeah. So after the dust cleared, a cave could be seen in the rock face. Um, a small cavern around about 15 feet long and four feet high had been completely sealed off from the outside world. Right. So it seems like 
they may have damaged the the doorway yeah. or the rock that was kind of plugging certainly, it certainly in. the exterior yeah yeah so they might have actually just blown <clears throat> that bit to pieces so there's yeah. no real way of saying whether or not it was completely sealed in as a, as yeah. a, a cabin or 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 there was a small entrance from the outside yeah so exactly. from the from the the mountain face mm. um but yeah so and as they entered into this little cabin this little cave they were surprised to see a small pygmy like man sitting cross-legged on a ledge now right <laughs> he wasn't alive he was mummified 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 wow. so they found the okay. mummified remains of a little pygmy like man sitting cross-legged on a ledge now in his seating position he's only six and a half inches tall wow yeah okay. six and a half inches tall um but and we know how big six and a half inches is, don't we? So well, well we know. We, we do know. <laughs> some people, for some people, it's bigger than others. But, you know, <laughs> let's leave that there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this is where, if he was to stand up, he'd be fourteen inches high. There you go. So <laughs> maybe he's a grower, not a shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anyway good. <laughs> back on back on topic <laughs> couldn't resist yeah right. i know right i know <laughs> uh, but yeah so if the, so when they did the the uh, when they looked at the measurements of the anatomy so the femurs the legs and everything he would have stood about 14 inches high yeah um, his skin was brown and wrinkly and his forehead was low and flat right. um his features displayed a flat nose okay um and heavily lidded eyes and a very wide mouth with very thin lips so Okay. A lot of that you're going to get from mummification anyway. Yeah, yeah. And mummification is also, it can be a natural process. So it isn't yeah, just okay. necessarily all about the embalming, embalming no. fluids and everything else. It can be a natural process as long as it's preserved it's, correctly. And, yeah, there's no yeah. moisture or anything like that. So the conditions have to be perfect, though, don't they? To the, you know, to the letter, to the point yeah. for it to work naturally. Well, they is found, right? uh, I know the archaeologists found um, quite a famous mummy. Mm. In uh, in the Sahara Desert, nicknamed Ginger, um, it's five and a half thousand years old, and it was oh, wow. naturally mummified. Um, oh wow! Okay. And it was so th there was a theory that the um, a lot of the mummies that came out of Egypt they had blonde hair or red hair, mm. and the the theory was that it was the embalming fluid that changed the color. Oh, but right. obviously Ginger, mm. nicknamed Ginger, um, was naturally mummified. That still had red hair. Still had the red hair in the red oh, wow. in the Sahara Desert. So that was really quite an interesting thing yeah. that I found okay. out about that. Um, cool. But yeah, so the it, the face looked of like an old man. Mm. So with it being so very well preserved, its fingernails could still be seen on its hands. Yeah, and the top of its head was covered with um, like a dark jelly-like substance that was still pliable. Right. Okay. So. There's no real at this point in in 1932. There's no real telling of how old this particular find is. Um, so what they no, did is they actually yeah. took it to Casper in Wyoming, and scientists came from all over the nation to have a look at this mummy. Mm. And they surmised at first that it was taxidermy, that it was a fake, mm. um, which, which I think naturally you would. Of course you would. Yeah, you, you would mean, try to debunk it as quickly as possible. There's been, there's been loads of, of fakes over the years. Yeah. Um, like with really like quite prominent fossils that people mm. said that oh, it's a fake because you there's two pieces of rock together or whatever mm. even like there was one really famous one the Piltdown Man um, which was a they were trying to say that it was the missing link between apes and humans and it turned out someone had just put a baboon mandible jaw onto a human skull oh, right, but, okay. that, but for but for like decades this was like this was the missing the, link the top right okay yeah. wow oh, so it can be done then it can well, yeah. for a little while until yeah. you know dna testing comes as i say it. yeah until science catches up <laughs> absolutely so um obviously this this specimen was on display for quite a while and then the invention of x-rays come into it and right, yeah. this is what got anthropologists really interested in this particular specimen okay. um because it it displayed perfectly formed man-like skeleton. So yeah. it didn't have any of the sutures on the head that you, right. that you would expect from like a human baby because obviously yeah. it's, it's all open, you know, yeah. and eventually they do close up. Yeah. And the tests showed that the mummy had been violently killed um, and as the spine was damaged and the collarbone broken and the skull had been smashed inward by a heavy blow. Wow. So, so that fits the legend of... 
what these tribes would have seen and described. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So wow. after the tests were completed, the scientists estimated that the mummy was a full-grown adult and was approximately 65 years old at the age of its death. Wow. So it's only 14 inches high. I mean, we, we do have anomalies like this that, mm. that do happen. There are famous ones that I can't think of what her name is but now, but she came out of India and mm. she, I don't think she's much taller than 14 inches high as well. She featured in uh, American Horror Story, um, the series known as Freak Show. Which Wow, what the actual actual actress. The actual woman. Yeah, yeah, she's wow. she's in there. And anyone that is a, a fan of and has watched American Horror Story, they'll know who I'm talking about because the name right. it, it, it eludes me yeah. right now. But what was really quite odd about this particular um specimen that they found in Wyoming was that um it had overly pointed teeth, like a full right. set of canines. Okay. Almost. Wow. So like a whole row of just Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah, so um, you know what that reminds me of, just as a, a kind of pop culture reference. Go on. In the um, the second um, Mummy film, the Mummy with Returns, Brendan Fraser. Yeah. You know when they're out in the, the exactly jungle and they're about. running to the pyramid. You have got those little, literally like those little pygmy skeleton things with the spears and the the sharp teeth. Yeah, and the sharp teeth. Whatever, and they violently kill people. Yeah, <laughs> the, the nasty little buggers. Stab it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, where yeah. they go into the oasis, isn't it, where they find that pyramid. That's it, yeah, after, yeah. After the air, the airboat thing. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind yeah, of reminds me of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of image that came to yeah. my head. And it's, to be honest, the image that, that there are out there, because you can look for it. If you look for um, the uh, Pedro Mountains mummy mm. on Google, you will find images of it. And it's, it's not yeah. too dissimilar, actually, right. to what you're saying there. Well, so what we'll... Um, as, as always, we'll share a, an image on the, the socials for yeah, yeah. anyone sort of listening so you can get an idea of. And also the actress from that film as well. We'll, we'll find something about her yeah. as well. Because it's quite cool that she used sort of her and it wasn't like mm. CGI'd or Oh, they, they did something. get a lot of people that had these various different dis- disabilities because yeah. they're, I know it sounds very un-PC at the moment to, to call it freak show, but it was... Um, it, it was based in, I believe, 1940s and 1950s America. So the right, idea okay. was that these Roman freak shows yeah. would go around like a circus and they would show off all these yeah. people with these various different physical anomalies. And well, it was no different to um, like the Beatles, Greatest right? Showman. And everyone, yeah, yeah, everyone exactly loved it. that because they made it into a musical instead of, I guess, more of a horror type thing like yeah. American Horror Story. So I guess it just depends on what you... What you watch, that I guess. Exactly, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we will be yeah, sharing we'll share those, on the socials. All yeah, those bits on the socials. But to, to continue with this, the, the examinations were allegedly performed by um, the American Museum of Natural History, and they wow. were certified genuine by the anthropology anthropology department at Harvard University. Wow. So okay, that's, so that's, quite, that's quite a big deal. Yeah, but I, I think that's quite a big deal that we we don't know anything about. But it's actually taken. Yeah researching into these sort of subjects it's not mainstream that sort of thing no. i think should be mainstream we should know about it's weird. yeah these but i sort guess of things in the regular yeah, yeah i don't know i guess it's i mean not that it's been a you know a cover up or a a conspiracy but i guess it hasn't deliberately been put into the mainstream but you know you know you can just just see how people are handling things in the last couple of years you know if if, if people were to actually think that these types of beings do and did exist yeah you know, could could people handle it? You know, would that start an influx of people going out hunting in the Pedro Mountains, trying to find these tombs or trying to, you know, and suppose, destroying yeah. the landscape and digging up Indian burial grounds? And a 19th century rush to uh, Egypt. You, it? Yeah, exactly. You can't, yeah. sadly, you can't trust people to just respect, you know, history and, you know, tradition and that sort of thing. So has it been kept on the, the down low deliberately? It's Not so much a cover up, but you know, more of a, there's, there is a possibility. Um, there is a possibility of there being a cover up because there have been so many remains mm. of tiny people and also what I mentioned previously about giants, giants yeah. as well in the North American continent um, in particular. Well, we've both found our ancestry, haven't we? Yeah, we have. <laughs> the little oh. people and the giants. Yeah, the little people and the giants. <laughs> I know where I come from now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, forget uh, 23 and me or the ancestry.com. I know. I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. And I reckon I've, I've seen the remains, man. Hyperborea. <laughs> it wasn't the it wasn't the milkman. I know exactly where I'm from. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. You are the Nephilim, <laughs> yeah. the world of the ice giants. I've, I've been called worse, so yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, my better, I'm, I'm, I assume as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so like I said, they've, they've been. It's not the only times that the remains of little people have been found in no. in America, and uh, in particular um, near well in Ohio, so not too far away. Wow! From our from good old beloved, West Virginia, yeah. beloved West Virginia. Um, well, a little trip down the uh, Ohio River. Yeah, and indeed. Slap bang there you are. Yeah. Go and go go a little bit further yeah. north, and there's a burial ground that was reportedly discovered. That contained a numerous remains of a pygmy race of people, only around three feet tall. Now, this was discovered in 1876. So again, not that long ago, no, really. Not that long ago. In the grand scheme of things, um, I haven't been able to get a carbon dating of it, but it, even still, though, yeah. is because um, it seems like a lot of the testing of the well, a lot of these skeletons have gone missing. Right. So a lot of people say they're in the Smithsonian Cover back up. area in crates, tucked away. <laughs> Sort of. Scenario 51 with everything else. <laughs> yeah. yeah, got good men looking after it. <laughs> Which we know good is in Kentucky men. and not in uh, Roswell. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's in that tri-state area. Right That's there. it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so in 1870, sorry, 1876, um, another ancient graveyard was just documented as to having been discovered in Coffee County, Tennessee. Oh, right. So again, wow. just south now. Um, the reports indicated the cemetery covered some six acres and held the remains of thousands of pygmy-like people. Thousands. So, I mean, that should be public knowledge. Absolutely. I, know, I mean, it, six yeah. acres. That's a but then if, that's a huge amount know, of land. If they're not going to promote, you know, the remains of one sixty-five-year-old pygmy in a, mm. you know, in a cave, you know, found by a couple of prospectors, then they're certainly not going to release, you know, certainly information not. on thousands. But I know, I know, I sort of gave a theory, or certainly my thoughts as to why they wouldn't, but. Oh, I wonder why, like, why it's not been. I mean, I know it's, I mean, because like us, you know, we didn't know until we researched it. So is it, is it that? Is it, you know, you've got to be in that um, kind of profession or have that kind of interest, you know, to just know. So are there people listening so. now that, are like, everyone knows that? Or, yeah, I guess so. I think, do you know what I mean? So is it just knowing where to look or is it, well, it's I don't not know. Been put I mean, out the there? thing is, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in anthropology, mm. it, it fascinates me. And, it does seem like there is this this idea from the mainstream of oh no 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 we we already know about that don't mm. bother like I don't want to digress too much about this but when you look at for instance the Clovis culture right. um, so the Clovis culture is in relation to stone tools blades okay, stone yeah. blades that they've found um, in out, just outside this town called Clovis and they've discovered these uh, these settlements at around about thirteen thousand years ago. So they've dug down right. to 13,000 years. They've found what they've found. And there are other archaeologists that are going, well, why don't we see what's further back? Why don't we see in the same location, see if it, there's been settlement there for mm. how long ever we could, we could find. Mainstream archaeology has gone, nope, that's as far as we need to go. And they've not sanctioned any other digs. Because it's a hollow part. earth and they know what they're going to find. <laughs> they're going to find. They're, they're going to find the reptilians down they're, there. They're going to find the lizard people. They're going to find Biden <laughs> down there. <laughs> Biden. Yeah, with his little, with his yeah, little, yeah, with his little facelift. Yeah, yeah, with his little facelift with the the extra muscles on his yeah. head. We probably won't share that, but uh, yeah, Google it. <laughs> You'll know what we mean yeah, from the Discord from the NFC yeah, exactly. guys. Yeah, but yeah, getting get back onto topic with, with regards to that burial, that huge burial, that six yes. acres. The, yeah, yeah. the they weren't buried laying down. They were buried either sitting. Like uh, the Pedro Mountain mummy, mm. or they um, buried standing up, which right. is odd. Yeah, but it is, yeah. you know, I guess there's only a little hole that they need to build, not need to dig. Well, exactly, yeah, yeah. But um, to stick around in Tennessee, I've printed off this article that comes from um, the Nashville Whig, and okay. it's July fifth, eighteen twenty. So it's wow. okay. it's even more. Uh, Backdated. Even further back. Yeah. yeah. So um, I quote, one of the most persistent and widely published tales about Tennessee prehistory concerns cemeteries of diminutive stone-lined graves containing the remains of primordial pygmy race. In July 1820, the Nashville Whig published an account of these mysterious remains, describing in detail the discovery of hundreds of diminutive graves on several farms near Sparta in White County, Tennessee. 
one of the farms uh, on the farm of Turner Lane, five miles southeast of Sparta, on the waters of the Caney Fork of Cumberland, uh, and on the other farms adjacent, have lately been found small graves sunk into the earth from one foot to 18 inches below the surface. They are about 10 inches broad and 18 inches long, having a flag, flag limestone rock at the each end and other sides, and covered with the same species of rock. In these graves are found skull bones about three inches in diameter, nearly sound. Wow. On the, the other bones are being proportionally small. So they are in proportion to the size of the skull. So, yeah. So between two and 300 of these graves have been discovered. In every tomb yet open was found a small black earthen pot, about one pint in capacity, containing a small conch shell, undecayed, of a gray color on the exterior and red within, and as transparent as a species of shell is usually found. The pot, when broken, exhibits numerous white specks um, of round, shiny particles. So it could be like mica mm. or something like that. At Mr. Anderson's, two miles. Mr. Mr. Anderson. <laughs> How can you speak without a mouth? <laughs> <laughs> um, at Mr. Anderson's, two miles and a half southwesterly direction from the farm of Mr. Lane, were found uh, other skeletons of the same dimensions in tombs constructed upon the same plan and of similar materials. One at least, it is said, was observed to have teeth and all the bones belonging to a human body. So they found a complete skeleton. Wow. The trees growing around, uh, growing where they were found, are of great size and age as any in the surrounding forest. The small graves at Mr. Lane's are arranged, but at Mr. Anderson's there is a large burying ground full of them without any order as to the position. That the bones of a human, Mr. Lane thinks, there can be no doubt, mm. and that they are not the bones of children. He thinks it's unquestionable. So right. the rocks which encloses them are... Um, are thought to be blue limestone and not that of the neighboring right. that of the neighborhood originally. Yeah, yeah. All of the limestone in the vicinity being of a gray color. Here is the mystery that baffles conjecture and puts all experience at defiance. <laughs> I love the way that they, <laughs> they wrote it. Yeah. spoke. It's brilliant. Yeah. I'm, try I'm trying not to put on a voice here as well. Yeah. <laughs> so the stories of the pygmies of Herodotus um, on the borders of Ethiopia and the Red Sea mm. and those of Homer in India, have always been treated as fables, which in the days of those men entered into most of the written compositions. How could a nation of pygmy men, not exceeding 18 inches in stature, build habitations, clear the forest, cultivate the soil, defend themselves against the ravages of the hawk and eagle, the wolf and the panther? Wow. That was the article that was fair point in 1820. Wow. So that, even further back than what was first sort of yeah and, well widely discovered and you know kind of with popularized these, these this was that gives you like a, a taste of the ago. sort of articles that were coming out about all yeah. these various different skeletons mm. that were being found in in the North American continent and I'm, I'm telling you there is a plethora of them out there I could have chose a hundred different articles yeah. to read from to give you that that those details but. Mm. I suppose you could, in a way, go, oh, it's just like, um, what do they call it? Jumping on the bandwagon, almost. Yeah. You know, the whole, whole idea that, you know, news first, not necessarily news correct. Yeah. But I think that's more of a, a, a modern phenomenon. It is. And I think that's probably more widely linked to things like sightings and, say, UFOs. And someone's, mm. oh, last night I saw this in the sky. Oh, yeah, me too. I saw it. And then and then snowballs. Like or, telephone, or, yeah, exactly. Whereas I think with... With stuff like this, I mean, I, I would assume it'd be hard to fake, but which obviously, you know, we've, since I've had it, it's, it sort of isn't because mm. enough people have done it. But for that sort of time period, would that, I don't know, would it have been done? And for there to be so many in different locations, different mm. climates, different soils, you know, you're talking sand, mud, mountains, you know, hills, you know. So I don't, yeah. It, I mean, it seems been, a little too. The whole idea of of archaeology was really booming then at that yeah. time. 
not just just archaeology but digging so they, there was lots of mining for gold and precious metals but also there was there was this real push for digging for dinosaur fossils yeah so they were coming across other bits so it's quite likely that they were digging and going oh that's not a dinosaur get rid of it you know so there's potential True. it's probably even that, more that just been discarded because it wasn't what they wanted to find yeah. or yeah no yeah mate you're right yeah it could be that yeah if I mean, if they were there digging for gold and they'd find bones they'd probably be just yeah pushing that aside thinking yeah i don't want to find that yeah exactly you know, looking for the jewelry or the gold or the you know whatever else they might be expecting you know to find so yeah as you say they could they could be um yeah moved or you know sort of discarded um certainly displaced sort of graves yeah displaced and, graves and, and we just think about how close the pedro mountains mummy came to being blown up yeah exactly you know, just, like feet away from getting obliterated yeah. so they never might, might never have found it so yeah, and I think that's one of those where, you know, you think, yeah, okay, that 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 was supposed to have been found, or, you know, yeah, that it was potentially a synchronicity. Synchronicity, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, but I didn't. I stopped you myself. Did. You <laughs> stopped yourself. But, oh, yeah. flow with it. Flow with, with it. it. Yeah. So yeah, so I I found this this particular thing quite interesting. So I started going a bit further afield from um, the good old West Virginia area, mm. um, and. I came across, and it's, it's an article that's been dart, darted about social media a lot, mm. and this one, it certainly is in the mainstream a lot more right. than the burials from North America. And this is the discovery of a hobbit-like being oh, yes. in Indonesia. Yeah, which I think any any keen listener would probably, may well recognise this, because I think we even touched on it, didn't we, in our um, very first episode, yes. the Bigfoot um, episode. Um, because it comes from the, the same region as yeah. Gigantopithecus. Yeah. Um, and we surmise that if something like that existed there, then surely something like that might exist elsewhere on, on the planet. Yeah. Absolutely, um, yeah. And this is in reference to Homo floresiensis, mm. um, nicknamed the Hobbit. Yeah. Um, and it come, it's, a small, uh, it's a species of small archaic human that inhabited the island of Flores in Indonesia. Um, until the arrival of modern humans around about 50,000 years ago. Mm. Um, the remains of an individual uh, who would have stood about one metre high, so they give three foot seven inches mm. in height. Um, it was discovered in 2003. Yeah. So it wasn't even discovered that, really long that long ago. ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, the partial skeletal remains were at least nine individuals were discovered mm. and included one complete skull, um, and it was referred to as LB1. Now, a fairly complete skeleton, including a nearly complete skull, which belonged to a 30-year-old human, a 30-year-old human, female, um, was nicknamed Little Lady of Floris, or just simply Flo. Flo, okay. Yeah. yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, these remains were, have been subject to intense research um, to determine whether or not they were deceased modern humans or a separate species altogether. Um, a 2017 study concluded by the phylogenic analysis that Homo floresiensis is an early species of hominin. So oh, wow. it is separate. So it's it not a, right. a diseased human or a deformed a human. Deformity, yeah, it's actually a, a separate a whole separate species yeah. in its own right. Yeah. yeah. Um, this this hominin was first uh, was at first considered remarkable for its survival until relatively recent times, but yeah. There was some that have decided that that it could have been could have existed up to about twelve thousand years ago, right? So again, okay. completely separate to us, yeah. but existed as as little as twelve thousand years yeah. ago. Now, wow. the Homo floresiensis uh, skeleton is now dated from around about sixty to hundred thousand years ago, right? So these are the actual finds that they found on mm. on the island of Flores, um, and stone tools were recovered. Alongside the skeletal remains, and uh, from these tools in particular, they range from archaeological datings to fifty to one hundred and ninety thousand years ago. Wow. Okay. So these things had stone tools one hundred and ninety thousand years ago. Jesus. Right. Okay. Absolutely incredible. That's nuts. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Um, my research also. Yeah. Again, sticking with the North American continent. We've mentioned these guys before, the moon-eyed people. 
Ah, we have. Yes, we have. We've yeah. mentioned the new Moon Eyes people. We haven't really gone into into them really. No. But what I also found was that the Moon Eyed people are a legendary group of people that were said to have lived in the Appalachia Mountains yeah. until the Cherokee expelled them. I think expelled is quite a nice term for Wipe wiping them out. Them out. <laughs> yeah. Abs- Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> Genocide. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> yeah. Um, so stories about them attributed to uh, Cherokee tradition are mentioned by early European settlers in America. Yeah. So in um, in a book that was uh, published by Benjamin Smith Barton in 1797, explains that they were called the Moon Eye People because they saw poorly during the day, um, almost like the the light mm. actually hindered their yeah. Their, their the vision. vision. Yeah. Um, later stories about the people added traditions saying that they were they had white skin. They created the areas of pre-Columbian ruins, which could be where the white being term came from that we referred to exactly. at the start. Yeah, yeah, white being. It could be yeah. literally physical white being. Physically white, yeah. Um, and uh, they they disappeared from the area. So this said that all these various stone structures that are pre-Columbian. Yeah. Um, that the natives were like, yeah, they. The moon eyed people will be. That's just, that, that's, that's just yeah. fact to them. To us, the, the Europeans who, who are more sort of material based and mm. more academic to a certain degree, they were straight up, well, clearly that doesn't make any sense. Some, something else, you must have built this, you must have. And all of their stories were like, no, something else built these, weren't us. And the, the natives have always had this tradition that they. They moved into the area mm. and expelled something yeah. that was there previously. Mm. So, uh, so Barton cited in his source a conversation between Colonel Leonard Marbury, um, an early settler of Georgia. Um, he was a, a revolutionary officer at the Congressman and the Second uh, Provincial Congress of Georgia, acted as a intermarry between the Native American Indians and the state of Georgia and the United States. So right. he also had a bit of officials involved with it as right. well. So published accounts of the ancient moon eyed people who lived in the Southern Appalachian region of the United States before the Cherokee came into the area have appeared s- since the 18th century. So as soon as the settlers got there, mm. some disagree as to the accuracy of the stories, but whether or not the stories are authentic as part of the Cher- yeah. Cherokee oral tradition, um, or whether the the people existed or just purely mythical, um, it's. I like to take these burial grounds mm. and stuff. So the actual idea of the moon eyed people, is seems like that's a term that's coined by the Europeans rather than yeah. the natives. So yeah. the Nimiri Gar, which is what the the Shoshone would have called these little people, mm. potentially. They could have been the same people, same thing, yeah. or the same race of of, of people. Um, but we just slammed the derogatory term onto it because like, using the traditional the, name was far too hard to pronounce. So. As, as only the Europeans could. could yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it really in is, our own tactile styling. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, the Georgia Parks Division of Department of um, the Department of Natural Resources has they they have a marker at the Fort Mountain that mentions uh, legends of the wall's origin. Right. So this is quite interesting. So the plaque cool. says, these people are said to have been unable to see during certain phases of the moon. During one of these phases, the Creek people annihilated the race. Some believe the moon-eyed people built the fortifications on this mountain. Wow. So that's, okay. again, that's something that's called keeping that sort of legend yeah. going. Um, today, there are different publications and and their opinions about the moon eyed people as to whether or not they were real people um of prehistoric times or yeah. mythical people from folklore. Whether or not the moon eyed people means that they had eyes that were like moons yeah. or that they could only see see at night or during, something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, these these are things that they're not even looking at anymore. Mm. So we've got Native American stories of these things that we're not really paying yeah. any attention to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's there's so much of our, our history that could even be lost. When Eve, there's some people that even um theorize mm. that the moon eyed people are 
Welsh. Welsh. Yeah. Welsh. <laughs> really? Yeah. Welsh, or they've got some other European. Um, I briefly touched upon this because I didn't want to go too far into it, but it's all about human migration. And there was a Welsh prince that decided to go west. Um, oh, west. Indeed, he went, he went west um, and happened upon the North American continent and decided to settle. And this would this would have been hundreds of years before the Norse got to there as well. Oh wow! Mm. Okay, yeah, absolutely incredible. Some of the stuff that I found on this. Yeah, um, but I nuts. I did mention previously Hyperborea. You did. I did, and this one. So yes, I've, I've previously mentioned uh, Hyperborea. Yes. And uh, this particular research took me down to um, a author and anthropologist oh, uh, right. of Robert Zeppa. Ah, and, yes. And you know, I've been following him. <laughs> You're a big a little, fan. I'm a big fan. Yeah. Big fan. Because I think, well, he, he, he's dubbed himself the world's most dangerous anthropologist. Right. Which I think is brilliant. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I because can he's believe been, that, yeah. He's been blocked. He's been yeah. blocked with the information that he's been bringing forth and yeah. um there's some some of the stuff that he does research and and uh, and, and present can be very un pc mm. um as to the study of, of human beings where we come from our history and, and such it's uh yeah so it, it, what he's what he's found with regards to hyperborea and um, is that he's looked at more ancient stories right um, and this one in particular, like just as like Plato had wrote about Atlantis, um, you know, there was a continent that just, you know, supposedly sunk be- below sea level in the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, Herodotus actually wrote about the legendary Hyperborea, okay. which was a continent which um, existed into the far north. Right. Okay. Now, on uh, Mercator's map, Mercator was um, a, a guy in the 15, 1500s that he, he had a penchant for drawing up maps and, and such based off of older maps. Now, if you do want to have a look at this for your reference, just search up Mercator's map, mm. um, 1595, and it not only depicts what could be very well the remem- remnants of Hyperborea, this right, okay. legendary continent yeah but it also seemed that implied that there was a race of pygmies once heavily populated the northern oh, canadian okay. and arctic regions yep. where these four rivers intersected mm. now one of the large islands features in the center of the arctic map um it's clearly written in the legend in latin so i'm not going to bother with the latin but the translation is <laughs> here live pygmies at most four feet tall who are like those called scralings in greenland Oh, okay. Yeah, so Scraylands, yeah. we yeah. we know is yeah. um, is a Norse term, right. um, to which they gave to the people of Newfoundland. Mm. They they called them the wretched people. That's yeah. what Scraylings means. Mm. Now, so who were these people that were mentioned to be supposedly four feet high tops, yeah. and where did they come from? Um, so on the back of Mercator's map, um, this legend reads again in. Latin, but I'm going to read the translation. Um, <laughs> the waters of these four arms of the sea were drawn towards the abyss with such violence that no wind is strong enough to bring vessels back once again um, and after they have entered. Mm. The wind there is, however, never sufficient to turn the arms of the corn mill. So right. yeah, it okay. is like, that's it. This, this yeah. water's mm. heading that, that way and you can't get out of it. Yeah. Um, but where's that water going? Mm. Go to the hollow earth, maybe. 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 Let's see it's where we're going somewhere. <laughs> see where your research takes you. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So written on the map, Mesotor explains that the ocean waters rush inward towards the center between the islands to the pole. Yeah. Where they plunge deep into the earth. So um 
I've got some images here that I've, that I've taken from the article, and, and this one here. Mm. Can you? Oh, can here you we go. See, little test. Can you see what shape that land might be? Um, could that be Greenland? Yeah, I was going to say. It's kind of hard to see from that particular image, which we'll yeah, it's, also put on the uh, Yeah, we'll the put socials. a larger version so people can... Yeah, yeah, I would have said, like, yeah, maybe like Iceland or maybe even a part of Ireland, it, it looks like it potentially it could be. Yeah. But it's that, certainly that region. It's definitely around that part of yeah. the... Yeah, definitely. So it, that in itself was on the Carta Marina or sea oh, map, right. that okay. was, um, which was produced in Rome by a, a Swedish gentleman. Um, Magnus in 1527. Or, no. Well, it's between 1527 and 1539. Right. So, because these, these sort of things weren't drawn up overnight. No. So, um, he describes that um, there was pygmies in Greenland that were small of stature, mm. but big of heart. Right. And apparently, okay. they, give, they gave the, interesting. the Norse a good kick in as well. Well, I suppose it's just worth mentioning, obviously, because we've mentioned or refer to them as, as pygmies quite a lot in this mm. sort of latter part of the episode. But obviously people are going to recognise that term because there have been various species of animals yes. that are known as a you know a pygmy elephant or something because right. of their because they're small in stature. So obviously that term, that that name has got to come from somewhere. Yeah. And it's yeah, come from a lot of these sort of places where these little elf goblin type, you know, peoples yeah. You know, would have you know well, would have lived. Well, so it it's been out. coined. It, it, well, I'm sort of just trying to say that just to sort of give context to why mm. we're using the phrase. Obviously, we're meant to be talking about elves, but we keep mentioning pygmies. But yeah. it's just trying to draw that that comparison. I'm sure Absolutely. everyone's clever enough well, to have done it themselves. Well, it but, turns out that pygmy is actually a unit of measurement, and it yeah. derives from the cubit. Yeah. So it's an old Greek. Um, I, I believe a, a, a pygmy as a unit of measurement was something like three foot or thereabouts. Right. So. Okay. The idea being a, a pygmy, pygmy is around about your three, three foot. foot. Yeah. So it's a unit of measurement, which yeah. is to be reduced to a unit of measurement must be yeah. quite quite <laughs> damning, really. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you, be, sir, yeah. are a giraffe. You know, that, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. Exactly, yeah. I've had that. Yeah, I've <laughs> yeah. been called pygmy before, so uh, <laughs> it, it's like water for ducks back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I don't know what they're talking about. No, no idea. No, no, not at all. But yeah, in regards to pygmies, <laughs> yeah. um, this was quite an interesting vein mm. of research that I found. Yeah. Um, this refers to Pliny the Elder, who existed uh, 23 to 79 AD, mm. um, tells in his natural history, beyond these in the most outlying mountain region, where uh, we are told of the three span men and pygmies who do not exceed three spans, i.e. 27 inches. Right. In height, the climate is healthy and always spring-like, mm. as it is protected on the north by the range of mountains. This tribe, Homer, has also recorded as being beset by cranes. Ah, okay. So this, right. <laughs> this was... Um, Pliny the Elder noted that the pygmies were believed to have been displaced from their ancestral homeland. And right. locates uh, a remaining population of, of pygmies or yeah. elves um, somewhere mainly between Egypt and Ethiopia, though right. also having been having found refuge as far afield as the southeast of the North American continent. And this is Pliny oh. the Elder two thousand years ago that, that wow. surmised this same thing. Yeah. So as we know, the Cherokees, whose ancestral home was in the south southeast of the North American continent have a legend which tells of the journey of some men um, who traveled south until they came upon the tribe of very little people called the Junsti Wi. That's what they called them. So right. this was the, again another bit of um, research that I found out afterwards where they at the mm. Cherokee have their own name. Right. Um, and they barely reached up to a man's knee. These little people, uh, these little men and women lived in nests in the sand that were covered with uh, dry grass. And they were terrified of the wild geese. Now, the wild geese came in giant flocks from the south and they mm. would attack these these little people. Yeah. So when the Cherokees arrived, the- And uh, geese are, can be big and 
violent oh, they're burgers, horrible. aren't they? They're so, horrible things. Like, yeah. you, you always were told this, like when you're feeding the ducks, mum would go, careful with the, the geese. Yeah, careful with don't the feed geese. the geese. Don't yeah. feed the geese. Yeah. You want to feed the ducks. They're, <laughs> one, they're nice. Yeah. Don't feed the geese because they'll, they'll have you. Yeah. Um, so the Jun, uh, the Jun Stiwi were in a state of great fear and anxiety because of these, these geese. Um, and they would always know when the geese were coming because mm. the wind would blow from the south. And white feathers, I don't know. But maybe the white feathers is like a, a bit of poetry, a bit of poetic, artistic yeah. na- um, license. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this was always a sure sign that the birds mm. were not far away. Yeah. So the Cherokee decided that they were going to try and help them. Right. Um, but in a way, like we give you the tools that you yeah. need, but you need to help yourself. Yeah. Which is good, actually. It's not doing the work no, for them. We'll send you on the path, yeah. but you've got to... Yeah, do the rest yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't yeah. make it drink, that sort of thing. Absolutely, yeah. So they showed them how to defend themselves using sticks and clubs um, so that they could hit the birds on the neck and kill them. Just hit it right on the neck. Right. Just wallop. Yeah. Judo chop. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> now go and get me some orange sherbet. <laughs> <laughs> So as the birds flew in from the south in great flocks, these little men ran into their, their nests to hide. But when the birds stuck their, their their heads into these nests to pull them out to eat them, mm. um, the men ran out and dashed them with the clubs and hit the birds as the Cherokees had shown them. They killed so many that after a while, the birds flew away. Right. So, so they sent them packing. Right, okay. For some time, the Junstiwi were able to keep the birds at bay until eventually a flock of giant cranes arrived so we all know how much bigger yeah, a crane is to absolutely kids. yeah um and obviously these birds are much taller and the little people weren't able to strike them on the necks so unfortunately the jinstiwi mm. perished they all perished because of these giant cranes because they didn't have the you know sound of mind to actually go for the kneecaps go for the knees go for the knees go for the knees bring them down Bring them down. <laughs> <laughs> the taller they are, the harder they fall. Exactly. <laughs> just you remember that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, now, this, is, uh, this isn't just something that was uh, confined to the, the North American continent. Um, Arab scholars um, agree with the 14th century Italian missionary and explorer, Friar um, Uderic, um, about the tales told in China concerning remnant populations of pygmy people mm. in the Himalayas as well. Right, okay. Um, And according to most ancient records from the Chinese, Scandinavians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, and the Cherokees, so all of these combining stories and accounts, we have an undeniable collective memory of an ancient millennium-long and worldwide pygmy crane war. Wow. (laughs) Uh, The great great elf crane war. (laughs) Millennium-long. What the shit? (laughs) A millennia long, oh, a long time. pygmy crane yeah. war. So what I find absolutely hilarious about that, just that statement, in, is that the cranes have decided that there's a war now as well. Yeah. That it's not just these little people, right? We've got to get these little people. We've got to wipe them out. Yeah. We've got to get these little shits. And, <laughs> what the yeah. fuck? But this, this was absolutely brilliant. So uh, this is why I had to include this in, in this particular one. Now, it seems like, unfortunately, the pygmy, pygmy's lost. Right. Um, now, the pygmies were fractured and reduced to refugee status <laughs> and forced into exile. Um, but imagine then with the refugee crisis going on at the moment, know, right? boatload of pygmies turning up and, uh, on the shores. Well, you, you could You'd house lose them your easier. mind, wouldn't you? You could, you could house them easier, couldn't you? Oh, well, yeah. I'd take a couple of them in, <laughs> put them under my stairs. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, you could be the house elf. I'll call you Dobby. <laughs> <laughs> That's mad. Yeah, yeah. isn't it? Isn't it right? Refugee status. Refugee status. Yeah. That's but, amazing. Uh, you know, it also goes on further than this. I mean, th- again, there's loads of images of of the tellings of these this pygmy crane war, which can be found in Pompeii. Um, there's also uh, Etruscan. Uh, there's a, there was a, a vase found in, a, in an Etruscan um, tomb, which the Etruscans were the... Uh, Ancestors of the Romans, right? Okay. So they found, and, which, and this particular um, vase is actually being displayed in the Museum of Florence. But uh, Antonius Liberalis, who wrote *Metamorphosis*, um, which is a collective of very brief um, tales that surmise 
the mythical metamorphosis affected by the offended deities. Right. So we all know from like the Greek pantheon, mm. certain gods were offended by something that humans did, so they sh- they smite them down. So like for instance, Medusa yeah. was um, she was cursed into her state because she was unfortunately attacked um, and uh, sexually attacked in a temple. Mm. And the, the goddess of that temple went, well, you didn't put up a big enough fight. I damn you. Yeah. And created the Medusa that, Medusa we, know. that we know. Yeah. Um, so in this particular one, he, he wrote that the war was actually engineered by the gods because of an immodest and disrespectful queen of the pigments. Which definitely does fit into that kind of law, doesn't it? Of yeah. the Greek you know, mythology, as you, you know, rightly give an example. So, it, yeah, it does kind of lend itself to so that already goes it? goes along the same sort of lines as um the origin of uh, werewolves so it was king lycan that um the gods took a very distasteful approach to him because he served human meat at a banquet mm. so they cursed him into turning into a wolf at night mm. um it's a king lycan lycanthropy yeah you know it's uh again it all, it's all a little bit greek isn't it yeah it's all a little it's bit greek. greek to me mate <laughs> Um, but also, according to Aristotle as well, oh, Aristotle, right, the, big guy. The, okay. the cranes do this, for they travel from Scythia to the marshes in the higher parts of Egypt, from which the Nile originates. This is the place where the pigments dwell, and this is no fable, for there is really, as, is, if, as it is said, a race of dwarves, both men and horses, which lead the life of troglodytes. So they live in caves. Right. Again... It's in that area yep. that other that same scholars region. have said yeah. is in that land in Egypt and Ethiopia, the east coast of, of Africa. Yeah. Um, and that comes from, that's an article from atlanteangardens.blogspot.com. And it's from author and anthropologist Robert Zeppa. And more so in particular, um, his book, Gods with Amnesia, Subterranean Worlds of Inner Earth, which is an incredible right. read. I've got a couple of these other books and they're brilliant. I mean, some yeah. some of it is a bit, yeah. you know, like uh, the pygmy perfect for us. Crane. Oh, yeah. it's perfect for us. <laughs> but he does go. Uh, what I find really, really interesting about his research is the the anthropology. Mm. You know, the human migration throughout time. Um, yeah, and basically how we've evolved into what we are, and also the potential of, of hidden information that we might not have been yeah. told the full story, and the fact that he's been, you know suppressed and banned and blocked from you it know various silenced. sort of social medias and stuff yeah and it's not anything i mean it's it's controversial in a sense but not not in the sense that it would be you know like offensive or oh, any, don't you know, get me wrong he's he's got some other content that could oh, be considered yeah, I've, offensive. i've seen some of it yeah definitely depending <laughs> yeah. on what part of the world you uh you live in <laughs> yes um for sure but as a as a general uh, as, as a general sort of rule, I, I think it is just information, and I think people should be allowed to interpret it as you know as they wish. If right. you know if people sadly you know want to be you know offended by it, then so be it. But others might actually take it in, you know in value and, well, yeah. and take it for what it is. I and, mean, the thing is that the whole idea of book burning and, and such, we know what happens around those sort of times with regards to history. You got a little friend on your microphone yeah. there, haven't you? Sorry. <laughs> Put me <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, right. But those of you won't be able to see it on the camera. You'll but Callum's it. had a little bug running up and down his microphone. He's properly distracted him. <laughs> I can see it. So he's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> you see, just at the corner of my eye, like just sort of walking across <laughs> the filter and it's it bugging like, me. It was like he's standing on his back legs, giving it the bigger neck yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> and what? And what? Yeah, what? what are you <laughs> see you later. <laughs> Bing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, digression there from digress. Uh, yeah, from apologies. Podcast. Yeah. I hope there's no infestation. No, but, no, no, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, it seems like we, we know where book burning has happened in the past. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. And it seems like book burning is happening again. Happening or, again, but on the, the the digital sense, I guess more so than yeah, than just the just physical the, sense. Yeah. yeah, rather than being literal books being burned, is people yeah. being silenced, which is articles exactly the being same burned thing. and reports and you know whatever else being. Yeah. Not burnt, but deleted. And so it's just a modern. It seems like more and more people are waking up to the idea that oh, why is someone? Why is that person over there being silenced? Actually, I want to yeah. hear what he has to say. Yeah, because you've got all of these people, all of these authorities. What do these they know? Power figures, yeah. bigwigs, 
that are going yeah. right let's let's silence this bloke let's make sure he, he stays quiet so yeah. we need to you know it seems like more and more people are waking up to the idea that yeah we're not getting the full story on no. pretty much everything no yeah. and, the, and this could be you know like with the recent you know ufo blip with the you know undisclosed files that were yeah. you know released and you know whatever else it, it seems that it's maybe the, you know it's a bit of a stretch but you know this could be you know part of that same you know sort of cover up has certain information and certain history been suppressed because they've decided that we don't need to know it or that we we couldn't handle it or you know and okay. that's why this has taken a, a slightly different you know turn this episode as i'm sure the listeners have probably noticed because we've actually got evidence yeah. fossils you know real life accounts and you know not just kind of you know magical encounters or you know possible sightings that are left yeah. to interpretation you know there are actually you know genuine authorized findings yeah. of habitats and skeletons and and history and not just from you know from the states or from the uk but from around the world yeah it seems like and, it's a global thing that we've yeah. that we've kind of stumbled upon really and the the idea that I think the idea that there could have been a land very far north, like Hyperborea, mm. yeah. that were home to this this race of, of small people, yeah. that then had to, whether it for one reason or another, whether it be the Great Crane War or yeah. you know being displaced from uh, natural phenomena like mm. comet impacts or sea level rising and, and stuff, which we all, which we do know, and I hope that some of our listeners do realise now that that thing did have. Uh, happen mm. you know look at um yeah. I'll, I'll turn you on to another podcast a very very famous one joe rogan experience um in which he had graham hancock and randall carlson on he's had them on a couple of times but get to watching the first one because they present some really really strong inf- um, evidence to suggest there was huge comet impacts globally around about thirteen thousand years ago and sea levels rose over 400 feet so so we're digging in the wrong place. So what's basically. down there? Yeah, we're digging in the wrong well, place. But don't they say that we know we know, we've explored more of space than what we have our own oceans? Yeah, we've explored like five percent of the, the the ocean bed. Yeah, and is but, it because we? I mean, because you know, if we can go into space, then arguably we can go down to some of the depths that they're claiming that we, you know, that we can't. Like, I'd love to know what's in that. Is it Mariana Trench? Oh God, man, I'd yeah. love to know what's down there. I reckon megalodons. What are they hide in? <laughs> yeah, 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 megalodons. <laughs> yeah, we we'll sent Jason Stay from down there. He did right last time. Right. You killed it all right, didn't you? He, he did all right last time. We'll yeah. send him down there again. Yeah. <laughs> but no, honestly, I like that. They reckon it's only like 5% of our oceans that yeah. people claim that we've actually explored. We know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the, the, yeah. the ocean floor. The ocean, yeah. Why? Absolutely. You know, I'm, 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 I'm sure we've got the, you know, the technology. You know, I mean, if Bezos and Branson can build themselves a rocket to send themselves up into space. During lockdown and whilst during begging lockdown. for furlough, by the way. Yeah. And getting rid of their staff and whatever else, wanting government handouts. Yeah. But um, but surely you know, or even um, uh, Elon Musk or someone must. Yeah. If it's not the people like NASA or whatever, they must have the technology to build a pressurized, you know, mm. submarine or something that can go down to those depths. So is is there a reason they're not permitted to go down there? Yeah. Well, it's the same. Is there a reason why we're not allowed yeah. to go further than four hundred miles away from the surface of the Earth? Yeah, because we haven't been back to the moon for quite no. a while. Assuming we went there at all. Ooh. Ooh. That's not that. <laughs> it's like that sort of podcast. Thank you very Provocative. much. Provocative. Provocative. <laughs> it's the wrong podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was the wrong one. Yeah, forgive me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, getting off the fence. I suppose we yeah. kind of did a little bit there. Actually. I guess we kind, we kind of jumped of, the gun, really. Because... We kind of did, but um, yeah. I mean, I guess just to just to start, I, I think for me, you know. We've done previous episodes that have, that have covered, you know, similar beings that we've, you know, that we've discussed quite heavily. Obviously, in this one, you know, and we, you know, we have commented on the fact that they are one of the same, mm. you know. So dwarfs, goblins, fairies, elves—they they are all one of the same. And so, you know, and so does my opinion go down the same route? You know, probably to an extent. The only, the only way why I'd lean more off the fence of of, of believing. Is because of the real world evidence, mm. the facts that are you know that are in front of us. That yeah. you can read however you like, or you can ter- interpret however you like. But you know the fact remains that 
you know, people of that description, tribes of, of these people Existed. did exist and they did live in various parts of, of the world, you know, North, North America, Indonesia, you know, to, to name but only a couple that we've, that we've covered. So I, I think it would be, it would be hard to kind of, I think, disprove it or, or find some kind of, mm. you know, <laughs> conspiracy i guess as to where all these stories have come from you know because they're not you know they're not like literary stories yeah. like you'd expect like shakespeare to write you know like with midsummer night's dream or whatever that they're they're articles that you know they're reports from you know philosophers and from scholars and from you know well-respected Educated people men, so to speak. Yeah. yeah you know p- people that you wouldn't necessarily expect to put their name you know to something like that yeah um you know with such strong evidence and yeah so you're, you're talking like with refer referring to like plato aristotle yeah exactly well, yeah. Says, you know these yeah. are educated men that at the time when um, academia was really quite important yeah you know it was something that was really it's one of the only things they had wasn't yeah, it really it goes beyond um campfire stories well, well, okay. i've got one on my shoulder now as well there you go hello mate but yeah, go on. <laughs> no, I'm getting distracted. He's found you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So, um, yeah, so these were educated men that were heavily yeah. involved in academia. And it's for them to take notice of all these various different things. And that's something that I've known as being, being a bit of a fan of Robert Zephyrs. Is he does mm. rely on the, um, Plato, Aristotle, all these Greek philosophers and educated yeah. men, and historians as well, really, yeah. not just philosophers, but they were historians. And I think he's right to, because I think what we do yeah. is we tend to try and overanalyze and we, we find um, symbolism and metaphors in places mm. that might actually be very direct and say, yeah. no, 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 there was actually a continent in the middle of the Atlantic, or there <laughs> really was a continent in the far north called Hyperborea. Yeah. that's now frozen over i mean it is possible. well there was a stretch of land that connected the uk to mainland europe and, yeah you know, I mean, it is possible yeah. because we know that antarctica for instance has huge swathes of forest underneath two miles of ice yeah so and it is possible that maybe up in the north the north pole with mm. you know it being the origin of these yeah. Little people and exactly yeah. where Santa lives. Now, well, of course, yeah, surrounded naturally. by his little people yeah, and naturally. his little worker elves and such. <laughs> so that I think, I think you're right in that now that there's real world anthropological evidence mm. that these hominins yeah. existed and potentially yeah, still yeah. do exist in places that we can't reach. You know, so yeah. like uh, for instance, the the Amazon rainforest. It's the size of India, mm. and we still haven't mapped it. No, it's the size of India. Mm. Like, so we could just say, yeah, we know about everything on the entire planet except for India. Yeah, we, yeah. which is huge, absolutely huge. Um, so there could very well be. Yeah, that's right. There must of, be reasons of, why people that live in the Amazon as well. But what is an island? Isn't it around around that um, around I- India um, where? Oh, certainly. H- humans, and I say when I say humans, I, you know, I mean white folk. <laughs> yeah, modern can't, humans. Modern humans can't, you know, go to because they've been slaughtered and yeah. they've been killed for even, you know, stepping foot on the, the shores. North Sentinel Island. Yeah. Yeah. There's only, and, um, there's only 39 of them that live on the island. So yeah. They're really, they're incredibly hostile. Exactly. Yeah. And so if there's islands like that, which we're told to not go to, you know, because of the inhabitants, mm. You know the indigenous people. What you know? What other islands or places on the planet are we being told not to go to because of the atmospheric pressure or the temperature or you know this that and the other? Where in actual fact, it's actually because of what they found there mm. that um, you know yeah, prevents us from those. yeah exactly that prevents us from going there because they feel that they're you know sort of protecting us. So is is it a you know kind of element like that? And you know I, I think like anything you know you've got your real world origin. Um, you know, which I think you've done really well in, in kind of exploring and, you know, in, in kind of finding all that, that info. I, I mean, I'm sure like with, you know, Santa's elves and, you know, other literary sort of iterations, I'm sure they've taken the real world evidence and, and, and stories um, and then 
yeah, dramatized it and, and bastardized it a little bit for, for say, for yeah. Hollywood, for books or, you know, for entertainment, mm. you know. But the fact of the matter is that there is that origin that can be dated back to an actual tribe or a species of people that actually existed that yeah. fit the modern descriptions of what we believe to be, you know, either a dwarf or a hobbit or a, an elf, a goblin, or fairy, yeah. you know, whatever yeah. it may be. Because, I mean, you know, fairies have been depicted as being, you know, sort of six inches in, in height. Yeah. They've now found skeletons of people that lived at that height. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what's to say that, that they didn't actually well, exist as well? well and we've only like... found one, we've only found one version or, you know, one, one iteration. Well, to expand upon your point there as well, like, for instance, when, when the ancient tales tell of magic, Mm. and healing and, and all these various different things like interdimensional but being able to but be in spirit as well yeah. you know maybe it's part of our existence or the part of this world's existence that yeah. those sort of things are true so it yeah. might be that like, for instance with like herbalists and things like that so healing in, in that sort of respect would have would have been magic you know, so back in the day, that's yeah. where the whole witches thing comes from because they were herbalists. You know, yeah. they would, you know, you trip out on the various different yeah. <laughs> things that they might give you, or yeah. that it might heal you, or something yeah. like that. And it's, I, I don't know. I, I think it might be okay. And certainly, the the case that some researchers have, have mm. done is that we have forgotten a lot of stuff that we're capable of doing. So yeah. it might have been a case that these be desensitized smaller people. To it. Yeah, yeah, we've desensitized, or we've just forgotten how to do it. Yeah, or just that. You know, it's so. like um, the 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 coin the, the the saying has been coined is a species with amnesia. Mm. So we've got a forgotten past mm. that may have interacted with these various different beings for thousands. Might have lived of among years. them, you know. Exactly. Yeah. You might have just, yeah, you know, we might have battled them, or they, you know, mm. you, you know, you invite your your little friend <laughs> round and, and stuff like that. <laughs> so it. It could have been, it could have been like a lost technology, not technology yeah. like the silicon-based technology that we've got today, where it's all motherboards and yeah. and HD screens and all this, but technology of nature yeah. that is perfectly capable mm. of existing. We just don't have an understanding of it anymore, so we just call it magic. Yeah. Um, so, or, or we just write it off as as being nonsense. Really, utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. <laughs> so, so, but I don't know. I, mean, I think that there's, a, especially with regards to the, the the pygmy crane war, there seems that there's mm. a lot of stories. There's lots of. I mean that that I love just uh, from just from just a fantasy idea, perspective. Yeah, just I, I love that. It's such oh, a good. Some of some of the images that that they might be these little pygmy people. They might be small in stature, but they've got some balls. Oh yeah. Some of the depictions yeah. that there are yeah. out there. I mean you. You saw some of them there. They've got yeah. holes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, they're certainly not pygmies in other places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, I think that, yeah, I think there there certainly could have been a magical element to it that we don't yeah. really understand anymore. So yeah, I'd it, say so. I think it's certainly been proven with regards to the mummies and the skeletal remains that have been yeah. found. So from, an, from a, a, a real-world anthropology point of view, it's true. It's true, yeah. But the magical side of it, that's the bit that really does mm. um, interest me as well, is that maybe we're just misinterpreting what magic is. Maybe it's just part of existence. We're, we're basing it on our interpretation or understanding of magic now, as opposed to what it would have meant, you know, sort yeah. of back then. We're not, we're not giving it the consideration that it, deserves for the the time in which um it all sort of happened so yeah again it's just interpretation understanding and you know and how you want to look at it you know what perspective you want to come at it from but yeah i think um i think inadvertently i think we're both we've both landed yeah, on, both the, landed uh, on the same same, side. same fence with, with this one and i think like we said you know obviously everyone's entitled to interpret it how they you know how they wish but i think for the most part you, you know it's it's hard to ignore um and it, it's hard to just kind of gloss over a lot of the actual real world evidence as you know rubbish or as nonsense or as being faked because you know important people and um, people far cleverer than than us yeah. you know have have proven it you know to be true and it's come through you know all the all the modern tests mm-hmm. you know we're talking about 2003 
yeah. that one of them was discovered. So, you know, yeah. it's, you know, it would have gone through, you know, relatively modern, you know, testing and, and whatever. And, and it would have been in people's interests to, you know, debunk it first and then work with what they had afterwards. And the fact that they've been able to actually say, well, no, actually, this is, you know, this is genuine. This isn't taxidermy or this isn't a fake. You know, this is, this has been found. This is a genuine, even you know, like, remain. Even like the Pedro, the uh, Pedro Mountain mummy. Yeah, you exactly. Know, they did yeah. everything they could to, to try and debunk it, say that it was a diseased child yeah. or, or something like yeah, this. Yeah. They, they can't. They couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, because it, again, it was something even back then, like with the sutures in the head. That and, right and there is a, the biggest indicator that it's a it's yeah. an adult body. Well, yeah, because the head's fully formed, the skull's fully formed. Yeah, exactly. And back then, you know, and, and probably even earlier than that, you know, we were talking about you know why people used elves or used their belief in, in elf. If, you know, if they did think it was you know a deformed hmm. you know child or you know someone with a, a the, you know disability so what we now know is you know sort of small people you know sort of midgets dwarves or how, however is the term to refer you know <laughs> yeah. that would have been used then as a yeah. way to say that's what that is yeah, you know true. as a as a sort of a cover but the fact that they didn't go down that route and they've actually said no this is this is genuine this is the real deal you know i think that has to be um i think that has to be taken for something yeah. doesn't it i think absolutely yeah. completely agree with you so yeah that is uh, that's our episode. There you go. Yes. And, I uh, think so. We we been good. Ventured into the the real world side of it, and I've really enjoyed that the first part time of it. actually. Which yeah, presented yeah. itself really as as much as we always try and go and find find it and, and kind of look for any real real world um, evidence. Mm. It kind of presented itself to the point where it was it was hard to ignore. Yeah, wasn't it? Which oh, I think definitely. there is a lot of certainly a lot of your research has uh, sort of come from. So. Yeah. Um, no, I enjoyed that. Agreed. Yeah. Absolutely. That was good. So uh, thank you again to everyone that's listened. And, and watched. You, and watched as well, <laughs> you guys over there. Uh, to our Patreons, thank you very much for uh, getting involved. Um, yes, absolutely. And you can find us on Patreon. You can. The, yeah. the Cryptid Ramblers podcast. Um, and all socials, also, in fact. All yeah. socials, in fact. Yeah. So yeah, we've got Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. We're on Twitter now, as we, we previously yeah. mentioned. All the, the same doing handle. Fantastic job on Twitter because I cannot handle Thank Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I can't handle it. I just I want to I want to tear into it. It has its challenges. Yeah, I can't. You're far uh, biting bite your tongue being one of them. But, far uh, more patient than I can yeah. be with regards to that. I'll and that's saying something because I've got little to no patience. <laughs> so that's saying I'll just, something. I'll just yeah. want to troll. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's all I will be doing. I'll, yeah. I'll be doing nothing. I'll be we'll be promoting I'll just be trolling, trolling and then yeah. we'll get nowhere. No, so, exactly. Yeah. Props <laughs> to you for that, mate. Cheers, so, mate. <laughs> yeah, you can find us on all of those. Um, yep. Check out our, our merch store as well. You can have the yep. merch that we are so beautifully modelling. Absolutely. Well. Yeah. Um, so, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. And remember, the truth is out there, people. You just need to be willing to see it. Absolutely. I like that. <laughs>
promoting the uh, yeah you stay seated stuff. i'll stand up yeah absolutely yeah, okay yeah. <laughs> agreed but also big thank you to our sponsor as well yes Hellfire absolutely Studios. yes um absolutely. remember go on to hellfirecreative.com yeah and use the discount code cryptid, cryptid. to get 20 yep. percent off also been kept simple for you all so there's no excuse indeed. yeah indeed <laughs> but no thank you to those guys yeah absolutely we look forward to working with them uh more yeah, yeah I mean, in, the, this, in the coming this being episodes our first experience of recording in a podcast <laughs> yeah <laughs> studio and everything it's it's been really fun actually it has been good yeah, yeah. It has, it's so to be good to do this in person as well not over zoom or, or some exactly other it's been nice yeah. skyping sort of program so different dynamics so hopefully that's come across in the uh yeah in the audio which i'm sure it has because it's felt different for me i don't know you know about yeah. you but it's felt different so i'm sure it all, it's been emotional it's been nice. it's as been always <laughs> and so I should, hopefully it will uh yeah it'll sound uh different for the for the better as well but so uh, but, uh, but thanks for, uh, to the hellfire creative guys for uh accommodating us and uh yeah be sure to check them out if you are in the uh in the area indeed yeah indeed so absolutely it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from me and remember the truth is out there people you just need to be willing to see it Absolutely. <laughs> I like that. <laughs>